lecture. And I want to begin actually by acknowledging um, Professor Emerita Bonnie Zimmerman, who is here with us today. And um, let's see if I can uh, spotlight her here. Um, thank you, Professor Zimmerman, for being here and, um, uh, and, and really supporting this uh, lesbian lecture every year. Um, if you're talking, you need to unmute yourself with the microphone on the... I was just saying you're welcome. Okay, thank you. All right, and so uh, this year's um, lesbian lecture topic will be from Professor Merit Sullivan, and um, she is Assistant Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, and she's currently a Mellon Emerging Faculty Leadership Fellow through the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. And broadly speaking, Professor Sullivan is interested in the relationship between activist movements and other forms of knowledge production. She worked for many years in LGBT public health before completing a PhD in women's gender and sexuality studies. Professor Sullivan's forthcoming book, Lesbian Death, explores the current anxiety that lesbian as both an identity and a politic is facing extinction. Her next book is a cultural history of the herpes virus. Professor Sullivan's work has been published in the Journal of Homosexuality, the Journal of Lesbian Studies, and Women's Studies Quarterly, Differences, a Journal of Feminist Cultural Studies, among others. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Sullivan, who will be giving a talk on the question of lesbian extinction. Welcome. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen here. If you all give me one moment. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rafflam, for having me in your class today. And thank you to Professors Ghosh and Watcott for the invitation. Um, and especially thank you to Heidi Doyle for organizing and making everything happen. And of course, to Dr. Bonnie Zimmerman. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, th originally, this talk was supposed to take place on March 24th. And when we postponed until the fall, I'm not sure any of us could imagine that we would still be living under these conditions. So I just wanna take a moment to like acknowledge that these are not okay times. Uh, like I'm not okay, I'm sure most of you are not okay, but I do think that these are times to think with, about, and through lesbian. Um, so the image that you see behind me, I just wanna say is, is not where I physically am, but it is an image of the Lesbian History Archives in Brooklyn, um, which I think is an apt sort of setting for my talk today. Uh, but I'm actually joining you from my home in Los Angeles, where I am an uninvited guest or a settler on Chumash and Tongva land. And as the wildfires burn around Los Angeles this morning, and in the wake of the recent major success of an indigenous leg collective, to return homes to the community. I wanna voice my support and be an accomplice to the work of na native sovereignty and to returning this land to indigenous stewardship. Um, so you have in front of you a slide that sort of introduces my talk. The slide is black with white writing. Uh, the title of my talk today is on the question of lesbian extinction. This is for the Bonnie Zimmerman lesbian lecture series at San Diego State University. And as Dr. Rothblum said, I'm Merid Sullivan, um, currently professor, assistant professor at Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. So I wanna begin my talk today thinking about lesbian lives and lesbian history. So let me start with a quick personal story. 20 years ago, I was a young queer undergraduate at a small Catholic liberal arts college in a small New England industrial town. And while we had early iterations of the internet, including AOL chat rooms and live journal, these were the days before Google and Wikipedia. Uh, so before you could just sort of Google search lesbian. And as I came into my own political and social commitments, I would spend hours, sometimes even days in the HQ section of the library. And it was here that I first discovered the work of Bonnie Zimmerman whether it was the new lesbian studies reader or cross purposes, lesbians, feminists and the limits of alliance, or halfway through my college career, the encyclopedia of lesbian and gay histories and cultures. It was here in the HQ section 
guided by Dr. Zimmerman and others, that I discovered the rich contours, the deep histories, and the political promises of lesbian life. Which is to say, one, I never in my wildest dreams could have imagined that I would one day be giving a, a titled lecture named for Dr. Zimmerman. So it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you. But also the very fact that I'm giving said lecture is due in no small part to the work of Dr. Zimmerman and her contemporaries, and very specifically to the work and legacy of lesbian feminism. So what does it mean to say legacy? The legacy of lesbian feminism. When I hear the term legacy, it implies that whatever is to follow is now over, done. We talk about the legacy of Babe Ruth, which might be part of my own lesbian legacy. Or when I Google search legacy, legacy.com is the first hit a collection of obituaries and elegies for people who have passed. So when I say the legacy of lesbian feminism, the implication is that lesbian feminism is something in the past that perhaps is remembered or even lauded today. And that, my friends, is where my project and my lecture today starts. So let me give you a quick map of what we'll cover. Um, my plan is to talk for about 30 minutes and then open this up to discussion. So first I'm gonna offer a provocation, namely that lesbian is dead. Then I'm going to define lesbian as a political commitment rather than a sexual practice that exists outside of politics. I'm going to offer an analysis for two case studies that I see as emblematic around the, of the anxieties around lesbian extinction. And then I'm gonna close by returning to the question of what lesbian is. Um, so one caveat, this is like, a big gloss, I'm gonna drop a lot of like little nuggets, I guess, along the way. Um, but I hope that we can pick any of these up in the Q&A. So let me just pause to also check in, everyone can hear me, see the screen, good, okay. Lesbian is dead. And before you, there's an image of four uh, gravestones sort of marking the death of lesbian. One says RIP the L word. The other says Dyke, did you know, do you know enough? Um, the other says Lost, Lesbian Organization of Toronto, and these gravestones are from a recent art installation called Killjoy Castle. So lesbian is dead, or so the story goes. And if she's not dead, then she is dying, a victim of new constellations of gender and sexuality. Or perhaps she's a victim of her own making. If it's not that no one wants to be a lesbian anymore, then it's that the generation for whom lesbian was a salient political claim has so well succeeded in their goals of lesbian mainstreaming that lesbian no longer carries political weight. Conversely, the story is that lesbian is too readily aligned with gender essentialism and anachronistic rejections of avant-garde cultures, that lesbian has been superseded by queer or now trans and left to the trash bin of mistakes of yesterday. Again, or so the story goes. So my talk today is drawn from a book project that I'm finishing that is currently titled Lesbian Death. In this project, I'm interested in the ways that stories animate certain kinds of political commitments. And the story of lesbian death is one such story. And it's a complicated story. So to start, I should just say outright, I don't think lesbian is dead. I don't think that lesbian is dead because on the one hand, I know a lot of lesbians and they are very much alive. I also used to work in public health. And in that work, I was responsible for recruiting lesbians to studies and marketing healthcare to lesbians. So I feel like there are still lesbians. And let me say even more directly, there are still people who call themselves lesbians in all age brackets and demographics. But there is also a very animated story that lesbian is on the decline and that no one wants to be a lesbian anymore. And part of what I argue in my book is actually that this story of lesbian is not new. That indeed lesbian has, since at least the 1970s, been marked by these kinds of border wars. But if there are still plenty of people who want to be lesbians, then what is the driving claims, what is driving the claims that lesbian is dying? So what is a lesbian? You have in front of you an image of three women wearing shirts um, that say Lavender Menace. The image is in black and white, but the shirts, if, if rendered in color, would be lavender. 
and the woman in the middle of the image is holding up her fist in a sort of um, revolutionary power sign. So what is lesbian? Quote, a lesbian is the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion, end quote. So begins the manifesto, the woman identified woman. On May 1st, 1970, in response to the continued sidelining of lesbian concerns in the mainstream women's liberation movement, a group calling themselves the Radical Lesbians staged a zap at the second Congress to unite women. As the meeting was called to open, the Radical Lesbians cut the lights and the sound, and when the lights returned, women across the theater had removed their jackets and shirts to reveal screen printed tees declaring themselves part of the Lavender Menace. So just quickly, Betty Friedan, who uh, author of The Feminine Mystique, one of the founders of the National Organization for Women, had declared uh, a sort of emphasis on lesbian issues to be a kind of lavender menace, that this was something that's sort of taking away from more mainstream women's liberation um, concerns. So the Woman Identified Woman is a political manifesto. And so when, during the ZAP, um, the radical lesbians passed out this 10 paragraph manifesto called The Woman Identified Woman. And the woman identified woman is a political manifesto and is one of a number of events and actions across the 1970s that marks the emergence of the feminist as lesbian to use Victoria Hesford's term. The radical lesbians and the many aligned groups that followed understand lesbian not only as a sexual identity, but also as a political commitment and response to the structuring of woman in a misogynistic and heterosexist society. The commitment to lesbian as a political framework is one of the defining features of 1970s radical feminism, a feature that led activist Ty Grace Atkinson to declare feminism is the theory, lesbianism is the practice. So the political commitments of lesbian feminism across the 1970s resulted in many of the institutions that we currently associate with the political histories of feminism, including back to the land movements, women's music festivals, feminist bookstores, and an emphasis on lesbian space and lesbian community. So to recap, lesbian emerges as this like very salient political claim in the 1970s. And that's part of um, what I think is at stake in current anxieties around lesbian loss. Um, but also these, the, these sort of histories um, have been accused of foregrounding the concerns and tactics of white middle-class women, as well as a kind of exclusionary politics. And I say accused not because it's wrong, but, but because I think there's more recent work that, that sort of demonstrates the ways in which those stories also do a certain kind of political work. Um, and that's a little bit to the side of my talk for today, but we will come back to it. So more recently, the panic over lesbians extinction hit a nadir in the months and year leading up to the 2016 election. In April 2016, before Trump was the surprise Republican nominee, a point to which I'll return later, Lesbian comedian Kate Clinton, no relation to Hillary as far as I know, published an elegy to the lesbian in the Washington Blade, DC's Gay Weekly. So on the screen in front of you is um, a screenshot from a you know, newspaper article on April 28th, 2016, under the title, What Caused Lesbian Extinction? And underneath is a black and white photo from the National March on Washington for gays, lesbian and gay rights in 1987 um, with a bunch of people behind a, a banner declaring or you know titling the march. So Kate Clinton publishes this essay, What Caused Lesbian Extinction? Clinton's essay is a satirical take and she narrates a newswire release from the year 8093 announcing that scientists in an archeological dig reminiscent of the methods of Jurassic Park have reanimated through the wonders of DNA and softball leather, the now extinct species, the lesbian. The finding is a breakthrough because the reanimated lesbian, aptly named Amber, is now able to confirm what scientists have spent millennia trying to understand, what killed off the lesbian. Clinton's piece followed uh, 2015 as a landmark year for lesbian death. Two major events catalyzed claims of lesbian death in 2015, First, the closing of San Francisco's Lexington Club, and second, the end of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. So the seemingly concomitant, though somewhat unrelated um, in their cause, events led one author to proclaim the death of the lesbian uh, in the Huffington Post. So on the screen in front of you is a screen cap from the Huffington Post of an essay 
published in 2015 titled The Death of the Lesbian. And underneath the title is a picture of two white lesbians embracing. They appear naked, one's behind the other. Um, so, so there's this article in the Huffington Post and later it prompted Slate to run a special issue of their art outward section titled, What Does Lesbian Mean in 2016? So 2015 is this real year of like anxiety um, and, and a real mainstream media pickup of questions of lesbian death. So the lesbian died in 2015, or no, not, not that, let's just say lesbian died in 2015. And that death is staked in two very specific events, the closing of the Lexington Club and the end of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. So I take up these events because they are, I argue, emblematic of the two stories that narrate lesbian demise. One, that lesbian or more readily gay and lesbian mainstreaming has been so successful that lesbians don't need their own spaces anymore or are no longer interested in lesbian bars. And two, the trans exclusion has become such a hallmark of lesbian space that the whole project has fallen apart. Both of these stories, I argue, sidestep wider questions about attachments to lesbian as a political commitment and also sort of double down on a commitment to lesbian death without thinking lesbian more capaciously. So on the screen in front of you is a picture of outside the Lexington Club um, after the space was officially closed. There's a number of queers, queer people dressed in sort of like in a sort of punk aesthetic on the corner. There's a poster that says, where is our queer space? And um, a pink banner that says, fight conformity, bash back. So the Lexington Club, which opened in 1997 in the heart of the Mission District, has been sort of a symbol of lesbian bars for 20 years. Um, it was a very small bar for anyone who's ever been there, um, somewhat emblematic of San Francisco seediness is like could be could described as a dive bar, um, but a great queer lesbian space. So the mission has been a central space of San Francisco's gentrification since at least the 1970s with the influx of white and gay, white, gay and lesbian residents. And while this area has long been home to Mexican immigrant communities, the cheap rents and West Coast allure for the 1990s white queers, or sorry, for 1990s queers, brought an influx of mostly white, lesbian, and queer young people to the mission. Given the patterns of gentrification in the 20th and 21st century, US cities, lesbian bars, or at least those lesbian bars that are most lamented as lost, are often central part, uh, a central part of gentrification machine. The lesbian bar has a rich history, especially in immigrant and working class enclaves. However, the past 30 years, and, and that means like lesbian bar writ large, but um, the past 30 years and the changing demographics of urban space have also shifted public meanings around the lesbian bar. So since the 2008 market crash, there's been a staggering number of closures of lesbian bars. And such closures have prompted widespread panic about the viability of lesbian life in the absence of lesbian space. It's of note, however, that the vast majority of bars that have closed in the past decade were themselves only open for less than a decade. In other words, many of the bars that are lamented as the nail in the coffin of lesbian life were part of the rise of LGBT consumerism in the late 20th and early 21st century. Most of these bars, though certainly not all, as they are often imagined, sorry, most of these bars, though certainly not all, are not as they are often imagined, holdovers from the hey heyday of mid-century clandestine lesbian life. So in 2005, the closing of the Lexington was emblematic of two national trends. First, that San Francisco had become the epicenter of a shifting economy driven largely by big tech and Silicon Valley startups. And second, the closing of the Lex was further confirmation of a nearly decades long decline in dedicated le lesbian spaces in major urban areas. Lesbian bars, along with women's bookstores, lesbian run coffee houses were supposedly closing at breakneck speed. And these two cultural shifts for which the Lex is but a symptom cannot be disentangled. So the rise of techno giants like Amazon have at least in perception sped the decline of women's bookstores and shifting urban de demographics that have driven under earning queers from the urban centers they once inhabited. This trend, of course, is not specific to lesbian bars. Lesbian bars, like other small businesses, suffer from rising rents on the properties they inhabit, as well as the exile of the communities they serve under the same financial stress. 
The demise of the lesbian bar is often attributed to two factors, lesbians thin wallets and a lack of a sexually driven party culture for queer women. Both claims imagine that there are lesbians who, under the right circumstances, would continue to patron lesbian specific spaces. Such lesbians are often imagined in distinction to young queer folks who keep lesbian nights and lesbian politics alive. So lesbian bars and lesbian spaces have always been much more than a cruising scene. And yet lesbian bars and lesbian spaces have also always been a place or a space of sex and desire. And while lesbians in aggregate have significantly less consumer power than gay white middle class, than, sorry, than gay white men, middle class lesbians have been able to grow their economic power significantly in the past 25 years. But the closing of the Lex had less to do with the spending power of its patrons or lack thereof. Rather, according to owner Lila Thurkeld, the bar was forced to close because of rising rents on both residential and commercial properties in the area. For other lesbian bars across the country, it's often a potent mix of declining consumer power, rising commercial rents, and economic policy that disadvantages small business owners that drive lesbian bars out of business. Such realities are not specific to lesbian bars, and in many ways, the closing of lesbian bars and space simply mirror wider industry trends. And actually, there's a great book, I just to pause and say there's a great book that just came out called The Queer New York that really tracks lesbian bars and lesbian spaces to both, both name the ways in which economic forces shift lesbian spaces, but also to think differently about how we think of lesbian space and lesbian identity um, in relationship to bars, et cetera. So with each closing of a lesbian bar, we shorten the history of how we track lesbian space. So for example, when the Lex opened in 1997, San Francisco had been without a lesbian bar for six years since Amelia's closed in 1991. And there's actually a ton of great, well, great for my project, archival stuff about the panic when Amelia's closed in 1991 that mirrors a lot of the, the um, rhetoric and the panic that we see in 2015. So, Regardless, lesbians continued to congregate, to make space and to make politics. And again, a plug for the book of Queer New York. By the early 1990s, however, the commitment to second wave feminism's anti-capitalism were waning. As Katie Hogan documents in her History of Women's Bookstores, it was during the same time that book women began to abandon their collectivist strategies in order to keep up with the growing corporatization of the bookselling industry. Bookstores and bars are different because bookstores are about selling a product that wasn't available elsewhere. Bars, on the other hand, were about tapping a consumer market. So the lament of the loss of the lesbian bar helps to highlight the centrality of a gay market to the establishment of many of these spaces. But the mourning of the closing of lesbian bars imagines that what is lost is a 1970s separatism when in fact, what is lost has its roots in this sort of like 1990s expansion of the gay consumer. In this way, the entanglement of lesbian space with capitalism and the shifting market economies post Reagan can be displaced through claims of violence and exclusion. So in other words, part of what I'm doing is mapping that like for a not all, but for a lot of lesbian bars, especially those that have closed since 2008, they actually have a very short history um, and so the ways in which loss is staked in relationship to 1970 lesbian politics is, is some sort of sidesteps the ways in which the history of, of lesbian bars is more rooted in 1970s gay consumerism. But we'll come back to that a little bit. So let me move to my second case. In 2015, after 14 years on the land, the Michigan Women's Music Festival held its final August gathering. And on the screen in front of you is an image from the Michigan Women's Music Festival. On the left-hand side is the music um, stage and around is women in various states of dress and undress, all sort of creating a circle around the stage and holding hands with their, their arms sort of crossed in the front of their body and then holding hands with the person next to them. So the Michigan Women's Music Festival or Mish, Mish Fest as it was known to serial attendees was a yearly gathering starting in 1976 of women, mostly lesbians, on rural land near Hart, Michigan for a week of music and community. Mishfest was one of hundreds of women's music festivals that grew out of and developed in tandem with the feminist separatists and back to the land movements of the 1970s. In its final years, many of the most famous supporters and performers at Mishfest 
formally withdrew their support and participation as part of a larger backlash against the festival's trans exclusionary politics. In many ways, Mishfest has become a lightning rod for accusations of lesbian anachronicity and transphobia. When Lisa Vogel, the sole organizer of the festival from its inception, announced the festival's end in April of 2015, festival supporters and media outlets were both shocked and unsurprised. In the lead up to the prior year's festival, a number of prominent LGBT organizations, including Michigan Equality and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, had signed a petition demanding that the festival allow trans women on the land. Since the early 1990s, the women born women policy of the festival had been a point of contestation. In response to the ejection of a trans woman on the land in 1991, activists and defectors organized a counter event. Camp Trans, as the demonstration was named, took many forms across the 1990s and well into the 2000s. <clears throat> but by 2014, protests over the exclusion of trans women had led to the call for the boycott from Equality Michigan, as well as a number of performers and prominent supporters, including most notably the Indigo Girls. So the supporters of trans exclusive space imagine that Mishfest is the last holdout of many things, women's music, lesbian space, festival culture, and in this narrative, they claim that trans women's inclusion amounts to the extinction of all things lesbian. The trope of the disappearance of lesbian space, especially it is, as it is framed through Michigan Women's Music Festival, often imagines that some new, newer, queerer identity is being staged deliberately to subsume lesbian. And as Vogel noted in her penultimate letter regarding the festival, trans men and trans women have always been a part of the festival scene. The problem Vogel argued was not that the presence of trans women, but rather the refusal to recognize the necessity of lesbian space and lesbian identity. And by reading Mishfest with and against dyke marches, for example, we can reframe this into a debate about one that's about the very definition of lesbian. In other words, debates about Mishfest are not about outside groups gaining access to and thus erasing lesbian space, to the contrary, Michigan becomes such a flashpoint precisely because of the debate around the meaning and uses of lesbian space. And again, this is, a, this is a kind of border war that I demonstrate has been animating of lesbian politics since at least 1973. So in 2015, again, we had these two major events, the closing of San Francisco's last lesbian bar and the end of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. But it seems hard to argue that lesbians disappeared in 2015. Indeed, in 2015, same-sex marriage became the law of the land. Um, and in front of you is a sort of a Getty image of a pride flag with two like porcelain, white, red-haired brides meant to signify this kind of like lesbian uh, gay marriage thing. Orange is the New Black, often understood as a lesbian show, was in its third season. And even by this point, there were rumors of a second iteration of the L word. So, so in other words, like, Lots of stuff is happening in 2015 that might point to lesbian as an identity persisting. Um, so what I focus in on is how central to the anxieties of lesbian ex extinction is actually a sense of loss. And what is said to be lost is a coherent sense of lesbian community and a lesbian political ag uh, agenda. Yet in reality, the losses that foreground these fears are losses of space. From bars to bookstores to women's music festival, lesbian publics are perceived to be constantly under threat. My claim in regard to lesbian loss is both simple and in need of a bit more complexity. First, quite simply, what is imagined to be lost in the erasures of lesbian space is a kind of radical political movement. Or put more directly, what is imagined lost in lesbian space is a specific form of a radical political movement imagined as having germinated in the mid 20th century out of and, and resulted in the establishment of lesbian centric spaces. What makes this argument simple is that it's easily addressed or dismissed by stating that old timers have not caught up with the times, that radical political movements persist, it just looks different. And then there's also a whole lot of generational narratives which I'll touch on in a minute, but um, yeah. So such a response is true to a certain extent, but the argument requires a lot more complexity. Lesbian politics and subsequently lesbian space, first of all, have always been contested. Much of this contestation is rooted in both transphobia or trans exclusion and white centricity. 
The panic around lesbian erasure imagines an orchestrated effort to disenfranchise and subsequently drive out lesbian specificity rather than a movement to drive out essentialist and, and, and transphobic practices or spaces that are defined through the centrality of whiteness or failures of coalition. Whereas the end of the Michigan Women's Music Festival has been a signal of the shifting tide in regards to the inclusion of trans women in lesbian movements and spaces, the shuttering of countless bars and bookstores has brought to the fore the ways in which racism and classism continue to be elided in the nostalgia for lesbian spaces. So part of what I argue is that very little has changed in the stories of lesbian loss from the early 1990s to today, or even from the early 1970s today. I think the conversations look different, but uh, this, the centrality of this sort of contest, contestation remains. So take, for example, Arlene Stein's late 1990s ethnography of lesbian generational divides. Her early chapters, and this is in her book, Sex and Sensibility, her early chapters, interviews with women who came of queer age in the 1970s amidst the gay liberation front, the women's liberation movements and the rise of black power influenced critical race politics highlights again and again, the painful inability of lesbians to identify a single coherent identity or political claim. Indeed, what marks this time more for most forcefully is the turmoil and interpersonal disputes of the time. Stein follows many narratives that brush aside concerns of class or race as growing pains of a movement trying to find its footing. And yet in the concluding chapters on 90s women, Stein echoes the sentiment that there is a coherent past from which new lesbians are attempting to distance themselves. And so part of what I'm trying to do is also like complicate this idea of a coherent past. Um, so Claire Hemings notes that feminism in the stories it tells seems to be caught up with, an ide with ideas about difference. The stories that animate anxieties of lesbian loss, by contrast, are caught up in ideas about sameness, specifically a same history or a same politics. The pursuit of sameness is what informs the meaning of lesbian as it is marked through ideas about women and women's spaces, and specifically as informed by only a thin strand of 1970s feminism. The feminism of the 1970s also saw the creation and expansion of women's spaces in terms of health clinics, community spaces, and social service organizations. But many of these, or, and many of these organizations were A, lesbian driven, and B, set the groundwork for a kind of community response to HIV. But rarely are anxieties about lesbian death mapped onto these locations. Shifts in lesbian space map quite neatly to shifting economic programs, and specifically, uh, the rise of neoliberalism in the past 40 years. Yet most of the, much of the most vocal hand wringing about the fate of lesbian and lesbian spaces does not engage with questions of neoliberalism or shifting economic landscapes. Indeed, the most oft repeated refrain is that the dwindling of avowed lesbian space is part of a generational shift informed by the rise of queer theory and trans identities, as well as the shifting terrain of dating in the age of social media, and the mass mobilized internet culture. What is disappearing then is not only lesbian space, but a sustained critique of and engagement with histories of anti-capitalism and anti-patriarchy that informed earlier political movements under the moniker of lesbian. In Nan Boyd's history of gay San Francisco, she identifies two modes of political engagement for gay constituents. The first mode was through the involvement of homophile organizations such as the Daughters of Belitis and centered on the fight for individual rights. The second mode was enacted through bar, bar culture and fought for the right to public assembly. The first Boyd argues was a politics of sameness and one that was more readily associated with a kind of individualized identity claim of lesbian. And the second was a politics of difference, one that predates current queer modes of engagement, um, but also thinks of lesbian as a collective, as a kind of politic. And this I argue is the crux. Individual lesbians are here to say, though certainly not all, many of these lesbians are happy to be a part of the mainstreaming of gay and lesbian life. But the insistence on the capital L lesbian as sort of mirrored through individual lesbian identity makes it seem like certain spaces are disappearing. But maybe lesbian is something else besides capital L lesbian. It's notable that the lamentations of lesbian loss that I've outlined here arrived at the time of the legalization of gay marriage in the United States. A number of years ago, I heard a longtime gay activist remark that gay marriage, somewhat convolutedly, 
was made possible by the horrors of the AIDS crisis. In this statement, of course, he echoed years of theorizing under the rubric of homonormativity. That is the idea that normative sexual practices rooted in the frameworks of heterosexuality when made available to gay and lesbian subjects would allow them to access the market promises of neoliberal subjectivity. In this story, lesbian is appended to gay as a kind of barnacle along for the ride to state-based recognition. But this also cleaves lesbian from feminism. And that's the point that I'm trying to drive home. So I read a kind of resurgence of the politics outlined in the Woman Identified Woman Manifesto in the widespread responses to Donald Trump's presidency. At a minimum, I argue that contemporary feminist politics, women's marches, pussy hats, the future is female, are aestheticized in citation to lesbian separatism. And like, just to be clear, I'm not saying that the women marching are all lesbians or even committed to lesbian as a political stance, but rather that the threat that lesbian marks to a certain patri patriarchal social order is very much alive here. Um, so take, for example, a recent, and like recent as in five days ago, article in uh, the news magazine, American Conservative. The article is titled, No Families, No Children, No Future. And in it, the author sounds the alarm on the sexual differences between Trump supporters and Democrats. Notably, he panics that over 30% of left-leaning young women report that they are, in his words, not interested in sex with men. In other words, in his words, they are lesbians. And if we understand lesbian as a mode of politics and relation that defines itself outside of relation to men, and even more so as stoking the threat that such a refusal poses to the social order of patriarchy, then lesbian persists. So let me return to the elegy offered by Kate Clinton, who, as you will recall, asked in 2015, what caused lesbian extinction? The trick that I didn't reveal is that when this essay was first written in 1993, on the, it was, or sorry, that this essay was first written in 1993 on the heels of a Newsweek article that proclaimed 1993 to be the year of lesbian chic. So the year, you know, Clinton's concern that this proclamation of lesbian chic is when lesbian becomes a stylized individual trait and not a political commitment. And so I end here to point out that this lesbian, this anxiety around lesbian extinction is nothing new. 2015 is just the newest iteration of 1993. But Clinton's elegy, however, with its references to Doc Martin, softball clubs and women's music festivals, laments the loss of lesbian as a political commitment. The report ends, however, with the reanimated Amber, our lesbian returned from the 1990s, explaining that the group had set sail to Jupiter and would be sl slated to return imminently. And so on the screen in front of you is a screenshot from a film called Codependent Lesbian Aliens Seek Same with three sort of conehead style lesbian aliens on what appears to be a spaceship. So the report ends, however, with the reanimated Amber explaining that a group of lesbians had set sail to Jupiter and would be slated to return imminently. And again, the year is 8,093. In other words, lesbian was not extinct. She was always here, just waiting to be reanimated. And we might read lesbian then as a politics of resistance, one that both seduces even as it pushes us, um, one that lays in wait, ready to return. And if I must say, like never have we needed a lesbian political like we do today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Merit. Um, so um, as you see on the chat, um, hopefully people have um, directed messages uh, directly to the chat or questions. And um, I don't know if Heidi, if you want to read um, them out or if Merit, if you want to do that. I don't see them in the chat. I can be Heidi can. You. Yeah. Sure. The first question was, what was your definition of lesbian again? <laughs> um, I would say my working definition of lesbian is as a kind of political commitment or a kind of politics um, that's grounded in 1970s revolutionary movements um, that stakes lesbian as a, as a kind of political claim that is against 
patriarchy and heteronormativity that sort of refuses the relations of patriarchy and heteronormativity. Thank you. The second question is, to what extent does sexism play a role? On our campus, there seem to be gay men and gender non-binary people, but few lesbians. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, that there is the wider question of like, what does lesbian do as an identity or as something that people claim for themselves individually? Um, on the one hand, you know, part of what I'm contesting is that there's not, that people don't wanna be lesbians anymore. Um, but I think that, and I don't think that that's true, but I do think that, uh, I mean, just bluntly, that lesbian has been sort of cleaved away from this sort of project of feminism. And so I do think that there is, um, there's ways in which lesbian as an identity doesn't get rendered as political, like the, the, the political, well, how do I wanna say this? Part of what I'm trying to do in my project is actually like name the ways in which lesbian is still very much an animating, like analytic and animating uh, thing <laughs> in what gets called, you know, like queer politics, et cetera. Um, even while acknowledging that there is a shift in who calls themselves a lesbian. And part of what I'm also doing is saying that that shift is a political move that, that people who, who might, who it might seem should identify as a lesbian are disavowing lesbian as a specific identity precisely because of the ways in which lesbian anxiety has been staked um, in these two sort of moments. One of which is sort of the mainstreaming of certain forms of gay and lesbian life and also through trans exclusionary politics. Um, and so in my book, I'm doing two things simultaneously, which is sort of saying that like just simply disavowing that doesn't actually do the kind of work that we might wanna do in thinking about these histories of trans exclusion and the histories of, of various kinds of gender essentialism, um, but also sort of fails to take seriously the ways in which lesbian, again, as staked as a political movement, um, I see as being very much still central to a lot of our most salient political movements today. If that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. There's questions coming in. So the next one is what is bi lesbianism and what's your take on that? I have no idea. Does, does the person who asked that question want it? I don't think I use the language of bi lesbianism. So if the person who asked that question wants to define bi lesbianism, I can give you my take. That would be windy. I can unmute Wendy if they would like. I don't know where they are. Okay. No, they would not. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so what I'll say, what I'll say is that part of what I'm doing is it's tricky because um, so like I said, my background is actually in public health. And in a, a kind of framework that I might jokingly call counting lesbians. And a lot of what I'm doing in my current project is less concerned with like in a kind of quanti quantifying lesbians, like saying there's X amount of lesbians in the city of Los Angeles, for example, as it is with reading lesbian as a kind of political movement and a political commitment. Um, one that again, I think is staked in relationship to the, what I recently heard termed the long 1970s. And I think that's like perfect. Um, but also, and, and we're in a moment in which there's a lot of returning interest to both the politics and the aesthetics of the 1970s. And we see this in critical sexuality studies, but also in like pop culture. I mean, not only in things like the women's march and pussy hats and things like that, 
um, and which I talk about more in my book is having also certain kinds of limits. But um, but like this year alone, in the lead up to the election, we are seeing tons of like on Fox, on Amazon, um, on Netflix, re well, what's like retelling of the stories of feminism in the 1970s. Not so much of lesbian feminism, but of like Gloria Steinem and the sort of like main players of mainstream lesbian politics. And I think that that's not, that can't be separated from Trump's election. And also there's many of us who are working on these projects prior to 2016. And so I think that there's, um, you know, there's been something in the air for a while to ask after these questions. Um, yeah. So in other words, if bi lesbianism is a category of like individual identity, I don't know much about that because in a certain way, I'm not talking about people. I'm talking more about, um, about organizing structures, about political logics, about the stories that we tell that make us think and feel in certain ways or that, that are actually how we flag our politics in certain ways, right? Thank you for the great questions. Okay, there's some more coming in. One of them is at the beginning of the lecture, I think you should you said that the retelling of 1970s lesbian feminism as exclusively white and middle class is itself a political project. Have I heard that accurately? Can you explain what you mean? Yeah, um, I will. So in other words, that 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 um, part of and this is I'm drawing here from the work of people like Claire Hemmings and Vicki Hesford, who have looked at the stories that uh, well, so Claire Hemmings has this book called Why Stories Matter, where she looks at the stories that feminist theory and feminist politics tells about itself and how it it she, what, it's presents what she calls a political grammar, how it does like political work in the present. Um, or Vicki Husford, whose book, Feeling Women's Liberation, returns to this moment in the 1970s to this figure that she calls the feminist as lesbian, um, but thinks about how <clears throat> the stories that come currently or like in the last 20 years that say like, oh, the 1970s feminism was bad because it was all white and it was super um, essentialist actually produces 1970s lesbian or 1970s feminism as white and essentialist. So like does this kind of naturalizing project that that completely erases the ways in which, you know, black feminism did not emerge in 1980 or, or even 1977 with the Kambahi River Collective, but was a, you know, political project that in mo most ways predates white feminism um, if we look back in the hundreds years histories of feminist political projects. Um, and also that, that there, there were like trans women were very much a part of and central to lesbian feminist and lesbian separatist politics in the 1970s. And so a lot of times the stories that we tell actually do the work to produce these exclusions rather than name the exclusions in the first place. Thank you. Another yeah, question you. is, are, are, when it comes to patriarchy, is lesbianism now seen as a commitment to actively trying to take down the patriarchy? Maybe that's a great question. Let me reframe it differently. Would we call a, a contemporary politics that's actively working against the patriarchy by foregrounding women as a capacious category and women's experiences, is that not a lesbian project? <laughs> and I think some people would say, no, I mean, like you can't have a lesbian project without people who call themselves lesbians. And part of what I'm saying is, well, lesbian, there's two different, there's two different things. There's lesbian as an individual identity and there's probably a really, there's um, great and neat, histories to look at that. And again, I would plug um, Jack Giesing's book, A Queer New York, but that's not exactly what my project is. My project is thinking more about um, lesbian as a po like political lesbianism, which meant very truly in the 1970s, like not associating with 
men or patriarchy meant having your own spaces, having separatist households, having our own means of production, etc. Um, but like there's a book that just came out in France, I'm going to forget what it's called, that's basically arguing for political lesbianism. <laughs> and so I think that these, these questions are very much alive, but are not, on the one hand, I'm not you know, the risk is to say that lesbian has nothing to do with sex or sexuality. And that's actually not what I'm saying. And part of why I pull up this American conservative um, article that's actually citing an article in the New York Times. But like the American conservative is in a full blown panic that everyone wants to be a lesbian. <laughs> and so there's something, there's a kind of paradox here where there is um, a wider narrative that like no one is straight anymore and also a narrative that no one wants to be a lesbian, but I also can't disentangle the, the politics from the two, right? So the threat, and I have a chapter in my book um, that's about the threat of lesbian separatism as being a real threat to like the persistence of humanity. That like, if, if followed to its goal, that a, fe that a feminist politics of lesbian separatism would literally stop reproduction. And that's not a metaphor, like literally would. <laughs> and that I think that's something to like talk about and think about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the great question. All right, they're coming in. Let's see, the next one is a comments and a question. Thank you for the great talk. I love the way you tie the politi political mode a lesbi lesbian as alive in current politics against the Trump administration. But I want you to say more about how this political activism has also been critiqued for being trans exclusionary and relying on gender essentialism. So I am curious to hear you say more about where and how you see the possibilities for trans lesbians politics today. And directly yeah. with something you mentioned about like marches, is that a place we might think about this? Yeah. Um Great question, thank you. So I spend more time on dyke marches in my book. So let me just say like bluntly, trans women are women, trans lesbians are lesbians. I take that as axiomatic, um, but I do think that there, that I think more so that there's something, there's something afoot, if you will, in the panic over lesbian space that does that does a lot of real boundary marking around lesbian um, that I think does a dis like does a disservice to lesbian. But I think so in my book I I um, pair the Michigan Women's Music Festival with dyke marches. And I look at the ways in which um, Mishfest or even like Olivia Records, for example, turns in which which is born out of lesbian separatist politics and women's music and women's um, like women's women seizing, I don't, I don't want to say seizing the means of production, but a, a kind of Marxist attempt at that, um, and then becomes Olivia Cruz lines. And there's, you know, Olivia Cruz lines is a huge corporation that at one point, like single, I forget which country I'm going to, I should have had these stories better queued up, but like at one point dropped a cruise of lesbians off uh, at a port and like single-handedly brought a, a small developing country's economy back up to, you know, out of sort of ruin. And I think that's really, I mean, bluntly, like kind of fucked up and complicated in the stories of global capitalism. And so I, I sort of mark how lesbian, I mark the 90s as this point of the rise of the lesbian consumer and how there's this kind of faction in which lesbian just becomes a kind of person who can spend a kind of money in these, wider projects of global imperialism and global capitalism. And I contrast that with dyke marches, which are um, started in the 1990s, started at specific, the first dyke march was organized in, I believe, well, in New York, but then Philadelphia by the Lesbian Avengers and organized, um, who were also dyke marches and the Lesbian Avengers were some of the central organizers of Camp Trans and organizing in response to what was happening at Mishfest. But also dyke marches are always in all cities for the most part, perhaps with the exception of LA, and I'll come to that in a second, um, are staged as sort of counter protests to pride. 
So whereas Pride has gotten more and more corporate and like in LA now you have to like buy a bracelet to get into Pride. You like pay to go to Pride and it's sponsored by alcohol companies, et cetera, et cetera. Dyke marches have remained true to a kind of political space that is a lesbian political space. Well, is a dyke political space. Um, and there's lots of interesting work thinking about dyke, where dyke politics are today. And I would point you all to Angie Willey's book on doing monogamy, where she thinks about dyke science. Um, but so I argue that dyke marches, which have always been not only sort of not have not done the kind of boundary marking of who counts as a dyke and who counts as a woman, but have also been always po like radically political spaces. Um, and I say in LA, LA might be one of the few that actually does get permits, but typically dike marches don't get permits um, and they, you know, happen concomitant with pride, but as a kind of, as a protest. Dike marches are always and remain protests rather than festivals. Um, yeah, and so I think that, that the persistence and even the growth of dike marches sort of counters the idea that lesbian space is disappearing um, especially as we think about lesbian space as a political space. So thank you for that great question. Okay. This one is related to more about your publications. Um, mm -hmm. Part question, do you have a book coming out? If so, when and what, what will it be called? And the second question is, what do you make of the phenomena of young women no longer identifying under, under the moniker of lesbian? meaning those of the younger generation seem to think lesbian is in fact an anachronistic term. What do you make of that? Sure, so thanks, great question. Um, so first I do have a book coming out as of right now, it's called Lesbian Death. It should hopefully be out by the end of 2021 or early 2022. Um, 2020 is really throwing a wrench in a lot of things. And so uh, it's, it should be out in about a year, a year and change from the University of Minnesota Press. Um, in terms of what do I make of the phenomenon of young women no longer identifying under the moniker of lesbian? I mean, this is, this question is what brings me to this project. Um, but counterintuitively, I don't actually answer that question in this project. So on the one hand, I don't think that it's true. I don't think that there is, um, I mean, you don't have to look much further than social media to know that there are still a significant portion of young people who identify as lesbian. I only recently got introduced to TikTok and it took me not too long to get to the TikToks that are like, welcome, you've found lesbian TikTok. And lesbian TikTok is all people under the age of 25. And it's very funny and it's very lesbian and it's very great. Um, so one, I don't, I just simply don't believe that that's true in an empirical sense. I'm more interested in what that, what kind of work that story does. Um, and so that's what my project is, is to think about like, what work, what is the work that is happening when we say against certain kinds of evidence that no one wants to be a lesbian anymore? Or perhaps more pointedly, it makes me ask like, what does lesbian mean in that question? Um, so one of the things that I didn't talk about is there's um, also this, like one of the things that happens in the disappearance of lesbian space too, is the idea that because of social media, there's no longer a need for physical space or because of the way that dating happens, there's no longer a need for physical space. But like actually, so much, I mean, on the one hand, that might be kind of true. I think that the space issue is a wider question about cities and, and urban economics currently, but also like the internet or Instagram and TikTok are like amazing places to go for this kind of like lesbian life, for people who call themselves lesbians doing lesbian stuff together, <laughs> including sex and other things. Um, and so I'm thinking of personals, which started as an Instagram account and is now an app. Um, and it's an app called Lex, which actually stands for lexicon apparently, but I I can't help but hear it as standing for like the Lex. And it's an internet, you know, it's a social network for lesbians um, and queer people. 
but through a kind of like rootedness in lesbian, as, again, as a capacious category. Um, or again, like I said, lesbian TikTok, or even just like, like lesbian YouTube, or just lesbian, like there's an increase in lesbian representation. And we can critique it all for sure. Um, but I don't find the empir I don't find an empirical claim sustainable. But what I find more interesting is like what what is dis what part of lesbian is is contested. And again, what I look at in my book is both like for people who do say like I'm not a lesbian, I, that category does not work for me. I'm interested in what that disavowal does or what's being disavowed, and I try to put pressure on how that disavowal itself doesn't do the kind of work to engage what is imagined to be being disavowed. Um, but I'm also interested in what kind of work the anxiety does um, to, to sort of think about the contours of what lesbian means. I don't know if that helps to answer the question. <laughs> I mean, let me say one thing, or let me share a couple of quick stories. So one, this project started, um, well, no, actually, let me share a different story. So I, recently I watched the L Word Generation Q. I was part of, you know, I was in my 20s when the first L Word came out and uh, found it, I was living in New England. I found it both to be like a really bad representation and also like a kind of depoliticizing of, lesbian and lesbian life. Um, I recently rewatched Generation Q, but I was more interested in the um, show that came after it, which now I can't even remember what it was called, but with the character Abby, who's a, a 45 year old dyke in Chicago, who's dating a 22 year old trans man. And there's one specific scene where they're at like this queer leather sex club and Abby's like, oh, I feel like I've been here before. And like asks the bartender, you know, like what did this place, you know, what did, what bar did this place used to be? And the bartender is like, oh, it was a sports club and it was this. And at one point I think it was a lesbian bar. And then you flash back to the lesbian bar. So like in the sex club, it's like all dark and leather and metal and house music. And then you flash back to the lesbian bar and it's the lights are up, it's all wood, like soft wood and it's like couples swaying and two women with acoustic guitars wearing take back the night shirts, singing a song that's like, and then you'll hold me forever. And the year says 2007. <laughs> and so I felt interpolated into this moment. And I was like, that's not the les, that's not, that's not my lesbian. That's not my history, <laughs> but it also is. I mean, I really came of age in the nineties. And so, I just, that moment for me, like really crystallized both the way that these generational, like that these, again, like that this timeline gets shorter and shorter to think that like this specific mode of lesbian was 2007 rather than 1995 or 1973 um, caused a kind of reaction in me, but also is like fun and kind of, funny and like seductive. I, I'm, I don't like the way that it gets like counteracted against queer as though these two things are two separate and con contested and like fighting entities. But I also think that there's a lot of, I just, I think that there's like a lot to be mined from the, the, the pleasures we have in this certain kind of lesbian aesthetic that brings us to a very political claim and a very political moment. And um, yeah, now I forget what the question was or how that really answered it other than to say like, I get it. I get the anxiety. I feel myself on a like strange generational divide, but that's why I like have not been able to escape this project because I think that there's more than just like, no one wants to be a lesbian anymore. Thank you. I think we have time for another one or two, right, Esther? Okay. Uh, next question would be, can you say more about the connections between white dominance and lesbian politics? 
especially radical separatist politics? Sure. So on the one hand, it's a false. That's a great, that's a great question. And thank you. And let me try to answer it succinctly. Um, part of what I'm looking at in my book is how this anxiety gets mobilized in relationships in relationship to whiteness, just plainly. Um, so I do a lot of looking at these moments of anxiety and seeing what's imagined is lost and how these narratives of loss fail to engage lesbian movements or politics or places that are not framed by whiteness or that don't center white people or white bodies. But, um, but also, like I said, the ways in which, um, so in the store, in the kind of story that feminist theory tells about itself, the Kambahi River Collective um, and the Kambahi in the Black Feminist Statement is marked as this sort of break moment away from lesbian separatism because the collective talks about how separatism doesn't work for, as a politics for them. Um, but that's that gets confused with being a break away from lesbian. And Black, the Kambahi River Collective is very clearly and avowedly a lesbian movement and a lesbian politics. And so part of what I'm also trying to sort of problematize is how in the disavowal of lesbian that I think happens, um, that happens a lot in white, like that white queers do a lot is to try to distance ourselves from these histories without actually engaging them, right? And so that to just say like, oh, I'm not a lesbian because lesbian separatism or lesbian politics was like all white and all trans exclusionary doesn't actually, like one does that very work of rendering lesbian then white or a project of whiteness, um, but also I think doesn't do the kind of work that we should be called to do of like really thinking about what, how, um, how white supremacy, how systemic racism, how individual racism is part of political movements. And so simply disavowing lesbian because of this kind of claim that lesbian separatism was essentialist and white, again, naturalizes the idea that lesbian separatism was essentialist and white and thus erases um, non-white and non-cis women from those histories, but also imagines that like the best way to deal with these kinds of histories is just to be like, that's not me. Um, and I don't think that that's good politics. I don't think that's good anti-racist politics. And I don't think that's good gender politics, right? And I don't think that that follows lesbian politics that um, as this kind of political commitment, and I would draw myself here to the work of people like Pat Parker and Cheryl Clark as a kind of a political claim that is to be against white supremacist heteropatriarchy. So I think we have time for one more question, Heidi. Thank you. Um, this one would be, let's see, might you be able to quickly mention what the Lesbian Her Story archives are? And then also a little comment that there's a movie called, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's Archivit as a documentary of the history of the Lesbian Her Story archives that people might be interested in watching. <clears throat> yes, and um, the, I think it's called the Archivettes. And oh. the, yeah, and Sinister Wisdom, I believe has made this film available right now or they will be shortly for a talk that's possibly happening this week. I can, um, I can make sure Heidi or Dr. Rothbaum have that information to send out to anyone who's interested. Um, but yeah, so the Lesbian History Archives are in Brooklyn. I wish I could give a better history. I don't even know exactly when they started, but they started um, Maxine Wolf and um, Joan Nestle started the archives in the 70s or 80s. Um, and they're now housed in a brownstone in Brooklyn. They are an archive of lesbian life. Anyone who calls themselves a lesbian or has connections to lesbian life and lesbian livelihood can submit material to the Her Street Archives. Um, it's housed in a brownstone in Brooklyn. Anyone can visit free and sort of rummage through 
these histories. Um, I have unfortunately only been once, but it was magical and amazing. Um, and actually, you know, like one of the flip sides, I was saying to Dr. Rothblum earlier that like the fun that, well, there's nothing fun in my mind about Zoom and having to teach and think through Zoom. But one thing is that I can put up backgrounds that put me like anywhere I wanna be. Um, and two, that like we can access events that are happening in places that we might not be able to go. So I feel really lucky that in the past few weeks and months, I've been able to go to a lot of events at the Herstory Archives and Sinister Wisdom, which is a lesbian journal, lesbian studies journal, um, has and has been in print since the 1970s, has been hosting a lot of events there and recently recorded. They recently put out an issue on the 40th anniversary of the Lesbian History Archives. Okay, so it opened in 1980 and recorded a conversation with all the people who um, contributed to that issue, including a significant, if not completely number of very young people, I mean, like young under the age of 30. Um, and at the event for this launch, there is like 400 people, maybe some of you are there, 400 people on Zoom for this launch and just looking at the people on Zoom was where I was like, this, this is not the story that we're told that like lesbian is dying. Here is a group of people who cross generation and gender identity and race categories and, and geographic categories and who are all together under the rubric lesbian lives, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so in other words, there's lots of great events happening through Sinister Wisdom and the archives right now that you all are able to join since they happen through Zoom in this dystopic nightmare that we're living through. I wanna thank uh, Professor Sullivan for a wonderful talk. Thank you all for joining. And um, if you have any specific additional questions, you can also email me, but take care and thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone.